From the heartland of America to every nation on earth, this is Jack Van Empe Presents The Truth in News and Commentary. Here now are doctors Jack and Rexella Van Empe. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to Jack Van Empe Presents. As always, we have some dynamic international headlines for you. And this first one, it breaks my heart. I can't believe it because it refers to our president, President Obama. We don't have a strategy to fight Islam and ISIS. Can you believe it? He doesn't have a strategy to defeat them on any level. And we're going to be discussing that with our guest today. Going on, Syrian Archbishop warns Christians could disappear from this country. They've been there so long, and now they could disappear. That breaks my heart, too. And then ISIS issues a dire warning saying to Israel, we are warning you, Israel, you're going to be destroyed. Well, we'll see about that one because God has his love for Israel, and we're going to discuss that with our guest also today. I want to say, first of all, right up front, thank you so much. I can't tell you how many bags of mail we got into the office saying they're praying for Jack. Many people sending cards, letters, greetings, just saying that we miss you, we love you, we're praying for you, and I want to update you. He's doing great. Thank the Lord. He's been uh, upgrade, upgraded right now, and uh, he's beginning to do some things that you know, I thought would take a long time, but he's coming back quickly, and he wanted me to say to all of you, he's looking forward to being with you before too long in your home again. Our guest today is certainly one that I am really going to enjoy interviewing because I praise the Lord so much for his testimony. His biography is something else. It is Mr. Mr. Walid Shabbat. And my, oh my, for the record, I want to say he, he used to be a radicalized Muslim willing to die for the cause of jihad. And he certainly did some things involving terror activity. Now, I want to say welcome to our brother because he now, of course, has become a Christian. And he's speaking out for the Lord. I'm so grateful for that. And welcome to the program, brother. It's good to have you today. Thank you, Sister Roxello. So good. I want to ask you right up front here, what was the main thing about Christianity that drew you from one extreme to the other? What was the main thing about knowing the gospel that you wanted, you wanted Christ in your heart? The message of salvation in Islam is very, very simple, very different than the Bible or Christianity. The way of salvation in Islam is that the Muslim can fight in jihad, and as his blood is shed in jihad, his sins are redeemed through his own blood. And this is something they don't really discuss much on secular media in the West. Mm -hmm. And that Islam does have a message of a different kind of salvation, that one must die in the cause of Allah, in jihad, fighting in warfare. And the Prophet of Islam clearly says, by the first drop of the Muslim's blood, his sins are forgiven, and he will be an in intercessor for 70 members of his or her family. So when my cousin Ra'id Shu'ibat went on his mission and he was killed by the Israelis, my aunt Fatima would pass candy in the streets. Why? Because he is interceding for her in heaven. And so there is the message of intercession in Islam, despite that they reject the message of intercession that Christianity offers, that no man can intercede for another man's sins, only via warfare, jihad, and martyrdom. And so what I saw in the Bible was that I do not have to die for the cause of Allah or Islam, that God already offered his son to offer on my behalf I don't have to give my son to die or myself to die. God has already done it for all of us. 
And that was a great message, and it was a great comfort. Great. That's so enlightening, brother. It really, really is. And isn't it wonderful to know that when you came to the Lord, you were enlightened and coming into your heart. What difference did that make in your life? When Jesus came into your heart, what difference did it make in your life right now? It was very shocking to me when I first you know, even didn't read much of the New Testament. I read mostly the Old Testament, went all the way to the New Testament. You know, you brush through the Bible and you brush through verses you never even considered. And I was looking for a Christian. I went to the street looking for, excuse me, are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? Looking for a Christian. Huh. And finally, I found one man who says, yes, I'm a Christian. You know, I invited him to my home. And I said to him, I don't understand one thing. Why do I have this great joy? Amen. I had so much joy, and he showed me the parts of the New Testament where it discusses the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit, long-suffering, joy, all these things. We begin to relate with the Scriptures the moment you, you accept Christ, the moment you become a Christian. Everything begins to be a reality. Everything in Scripture becomes prophetic, including where Jesus warns, I send you a sheep amongst wolves, that if you follow him, you will suffer persecution. All these things are prophetic in nature, and they become a reality. While we think that the words of Jesus at the time were for the disciples and the first believers, but it's for all times that when you become a Christian, he sends us a sheep amongst wolves. Wolves kill. And so while you suffer persecution, you also have a special joy that could never be taken away from you. Oh my, that's, wasn't that a wonderful testimony? To know that when Jesus comes in, he not only takes away your sins, but he does something for you right now. He gives you love, he gives you joy, he gives you peace. And, uh, you know, uh, I guess not long ago said that Christianity is the only religion that actually ensures you of eternal life in heaven. Is that, that's correct, isn't it? When Christ comes in, he's the only one that can give us eternal life. How wonderful Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. How wonderful. I'm so glad you opened your heart to the Lord, brother. Good to have you with us today. And I'm going to ask him to do, stay over and do another program with me. And I have other questions. It involves Islamophobia. That word, that's very, very important. We're going to discuss that on the program again next week. Well, I'd like to talk about the extremism of terrorist groups, how extreme they are. Uh, let's go to this first headline, if you will. Ohio, ISIS recruit was ready to cut off the head of his non-Muslim son. Now, that's his biological son, friends. To me, that's very, very extreme going on. American teen pleads guilty of online ISIS recruiting. Now, you know what? I'll tell you, that really disturbs me because around the nation we're seeing an increase of that, trying to draw people into it here in this country. Minnesota Muslims brutally honest, we want Sharia. Dozens of young Muslims there are leaving and going abroad and they want to fight with terrorist groups. I can't believe that one. Again, Obama, here's that headline. We don't have a strategy to fight ISIS. Oh, I'm going to go to our guest and I'm going to ask him, is that, is that right? Has our president failed us with a strategy to fight something that is so deadly, ISIS? Has he failed us? Absolutely. In fact, from the beginning, when Obama began his vision for the Middle East, what kind of a strategy did we have? What was the strategy? Let's dismantle the secular governments of the Middle East, Egypt. We had Hosni Mubarak. He was a friend of America. All of a sudden, Hosni Mubarak was thrown under the bus. 
Of course, we had problems with Muammar al-Qadhafi, but they were not this monumental problems. Saddam Hussein was keeping the Iranians at bay. We armed Saddam Hussein. And all of a sudden, we removed even before Obama. The mistakes also goes on the, uh, on the other side in which it was a, fo a lack of foresight on understanding that what the Islamists want is very simple. What they want is the removal of secularism. They want to remove nationalism. They want to undo Sykes-Picot. Sykes-Picot is very crucial, something in history, and that is the West began to dismantle the Ottoman Empire at the time, the Islamic Empire, and they began to establish secular westernized governments throughout the Middle East. That is being reversed when you remove secular governments. And so every time you remove a secular government, you have the danger of establish Islamism, which is really a one world religion and a one world government. So, you know, we have to go back to scripture which warned us about this, and that is God ordained the world to be nationalistic. That's why he changed the languages in Babel. That's right. Islam wants to reverse what God did in Babel and make one world religion Islam, one world government Islam. And that's exactly what happened as a result of the American strategy. So actually, there is, it, we should have a strategy to try and stop what's happening around the world right now with Islam. And, and another thing, and this is a very wonderful guest to ask this question. Not only are they trying to change our culture and trying to change America, and many uh, Christians are being killed, but they're killing each other. They're killing each other. All these different extremist groups are killing each other. I don't get that, brother. Why are they doing that? Well, they do that because, number one, uh, ISIS sees, let's see, the Muslim Brotherhood as not Islamic enough. We have to understand that the Islamic sphere has the scholarly realm, and that's predominantly the Muslim Brotherhood. It controls, really, the Sunni Muslim world. When ISIS sprung along, it did not have the scholarly institutions supporting it. You know, you have uh, uh, Sheikh Yusuf al-Qaradawi, he was the spiritual head of the Muslim Brotherhood. He doesn't support the establishment of ISIS, so there's a schism within Islam. Cults always create schisms. That's one way to identify cults. There's always these schisms. So Islam, you know, is such a religion that it's easy to create schisms. You have Shia and you have Sunni. You have Iran yeah. and Iraq. Iraq is majority also Shiites. So these schisms are there. And so even within the Taliban in Afghanistan and ISIS, there is also a schism. So it's loaded with schisms. And so, you know, ISIS is a Wahhabi Islamic institution. It stems really from the Saudi brand of Islam, Wahhabism. You have many brands. You have Sufi Islam. You have Wahhabi Islam. Mm -hmm. Wahhabi Islam is very extreme when it comes to graves. They cannot be extended over the ground. This is why Sunnis destroy the graves of the Shia, because Shia also pray and, uh, in tombs. Uh, in other words, they visit the dead. And so the Sunnis reject visiting the tombs of the dead. They tend to destroy all the tombstones that you see in Iraq or in Syria, all the relics, everything that is part of the civilization uh, that uh, the Shia have, they destroy it completely, no matter what civilization it is, including Christian. And so this is the major schism between Wahhabist and the Shia Muslims. And also we have Sufi Islam, which is another subject for another day. So we're going to be, I want to go on to that. You said including Christians. Yes. Let's go on to something truly in the Middle East, friends. And uh, even, even down to South Africa, Christians are really being targeted. And I'd, I'd like to address that really here on this program today. Take a look, if you will. France police arrest men planning to attack churches. Now, it's not just in the Middle East, it's also in Europe. There we have it in France. We all know what happened in Paris. Oh, we need to wake up, don't we? Islamic State releases new killing video of Ethiopian Christians. There you have it there. And then Italian police, Libyan Muslims threw Christians overboard. I can't believe the murder they're willing to do. And then two Muslims set fire uh, to a 14-year-old Christian boy 
in Pakistan. Breaks my heart. And then Syrian Archbishop warns Christians could disappear from the country. I'm going to target that one in just a moment, ask our guest about that. And ISIS surrounds the few remaining Christian villages in Syria. You take a look there. Few, few remaining. Not many left. Five attacks in five days on Christians in central India. I didn't realize it was so, uh, so bad there as going on in India. And ISIS captures 88 Eritrean Christians in Libya. Wow, I can't believe that. And then Fox News star goes all out to rescue Christians. Thank you, Greta. Greta Van Susteren, thank you that you have tried so very, very hard to say, what's my excuse? My generation has no excuse for not helping the Christians over there. Do you remember not long ago I quoted one of the Christians over there saying, why isn't someone helping us? Why? I want to ask our guest today, the Syrian Archbishop warns Christians could disappear from the country. Do you agree with that, Absolutely. brother? Do you? Absolutely. Uh, Christianity is being annihilated completely in the Middle East, in the Nineveh Plains, in Iraq, in Syria. This is, this is a society that first, were the first believing church uh, they speak in Aramaic language. They worship in the Aramaic language, the language of Jesus Christ himself. And they are so persecuted. The Assyrian Christians as well in Iraq is very heavily persecuted. It started even before ISIS where churches were being bombed and killed and terrorists, Muslim terrorists going in there and killing Christians. Mm -hmm. And we've seen all the evacuations that going on in Iraq. Uh, against the Christians. There's nearly no, very few Christians left in that region. If and when Christianity ceases to exist in Iraq and Syria, the entire Middle East is darkened. In fact, when I talk to Christians, not just in Syria or in Iraq, but also in Egypt, you have the Coptic Christian community, yeah. which is 10% of the Egyptian population. Uh, that's a big number. These are within the millions. Uh, they, they don't want to leave Egypt. In fact, last time I spoke to a Coptic Christian from Egypt, uh, he, you know, he says, if we leave Egypt, then the light and the salt of Egypt will be gone. And what is the use of anything if the salt and the light isn't there? In other words, they're willing to be persecuted to shed the light of Christ. You know, most Americans I talk to, where did the Coptic Christians come from in Egypt? You know, this was founded by St. Mark, the Apostle. This is a historic church. And even when I look into the Bible, if I read Isaiah 19, I find God addresses the Christians of Egypt because the persecuted of Egypt in Isaiah 19, they cry to the Lord to send them a Savior. Mm -hmm. And God will send them a Savior and the Mighty One. Who is the Mighty One? This is Christ. Gird your sword on your thigh, O Mighty One. In the Psalms, God addresses the Messiah, Christ. And there in Isaiah 19, Behold, the Lord comes riding in a swift cloud and is coming into Egypt. He comes to fight in Egypt. Those are things rarely discussed in the churches in America, which is very crucial. He's talking about the persecution of Christians in and throughout the Middle East when Christ comes for the rescue. So it is very crucial that we begin to be aware of this, to do something for our Christian brothers in Syria, in Iraq, in Egypt, in, in Ethiopia, in all those regions. Absolutely, we need to be doing something, brother. And the first thing we need to be doing is praying and then do something to help them over there. But we're going to also be talking about another group of people, and that's those in Israel. They need our prayers, too, which leads me to our new offer of the weekend is Judeo-Christian New World Order. Did you ever hear about that? Take a look, please, at the commercial. 2,000 years ago, Jesus, Israel's Messiah, and Christianity's Lord and Savior taught us to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. This appearing of Christ to set up the soon coming Judeo-Christian New World Order is about to happen. According to 1,000 biblical prophecies from the lips and pens of 16 Old Testament Jewish prophets and eight of the 12 New Testament apostles, this will become the most monumental event in history and Micah announces that this will immediately usher in God's final and eternal government. He states, the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Christianity's New Testament apostles describe this global ruler as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Isaiah, another prophet of Israel said, unto us a child is born, virgin birth, and unto us a son is given, second coming of Jesus. When this glorious hour happens, the government shall be upon his shoulder, and of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Wow! Come quickly, Lord Jesus, and deliver us from this global mania, mass slaying, endless terrorism, and unending war. For further details, order coming soon, the Judeo-Christian New World Order. Don't you love those words? Come quickly, Lord Jesus, and deliver us. Good to know he is coming again, but don't put it off. There's the 800 number, and there's the address, and my gift with your order. Jack's book, Israel's Final Holocaust. So please make the call right away. You know, Jack has often spoken about the extreme radicalization of Muslims, not only targeting Christians, but also targeting Israelis, Jews. So take a look, if you will, please. Jesus said in Luke 21, verse 25, nations will be in distress with perplexity, mass confusion. It's coming, ladies and gentlemen. Watch ISIS in the near future. We go on. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 30, verse 7, and Jacob changed his name to Israel, 2 Kings 17, 34. But Israel is going to be saved out of the mess. And that's Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. They're not going to win. The Palestinians, the Muslims, Russia, China, none of them. Why? Because God has chosen the people of Israel. And that's Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Not only that. But the Bible says that they are God's elect. Now, the church is elect also, 1 Peter 1, 2. And we won't be here for that time because the elect have been evacuated in Revelation 3, 10. I'll keep you out of the hour of testing which comes upon the whole world, out of Armageddon. But listen very carefully now. God's elect, the Jew, Isaiah 42, 1, 45, 4, and chapter 65, verses 9 and 22, is going to be spared. Now get this for all you Jew haters out there. This is God Almighty speaking, Isaiah 56, 5. I will give Israel an everlasting name. And everlasting means everlasting. And Christ is coming back and sitting on David's throne in front of Jerusalem, Luke 1, 32 and 33. And he'll sit there forever and forever with Israel who has the everlasting name. You can't get rid of God's chosen people. Amen. God is not finished with his people. Isn't it wonderful to know that? Well, let's turn to radical Islam in Europe. First of all, Spanish incitement, Jewish voodoo dolls kill all the Jews. Also, Belgium. Oh, my husband's heartbroken about this. Belgian cop writes on Facebook, I would kill each and every Jew. Now, he has been fired, thank the Lord. And Palestinian Authority ruling on Jerusalem proves that Israel is an occupier. Are you kidding? They were there from the beginning. Palestinian TV shows Jews and Israelis evil filth. Oh, that's tragic. U.S. official, Iran means what it says about destroying Israel. We better take them seriously. Listen, please, at the Pentagon. ISIS issues dire warning to Israel and former Israeli ambassador to the United States, Michael Oren. Obama abandoned Israel. Now, I believe that they're absolutely true on all of these headlines, don't you, brother? We have abandoned them. 
Absolutely. In fact, it's east and west. The argument over the land, the argument that the state of Palestine must be created. As Christians, we can't do this because in Joel, it's very, it's very clear that Christ will judge the nations based on the treatment of Israel and the division of the land of Israel. They have divided up my land in Joel 3. It's very clear. What you need to understand is that this whole argument that the Arabs must own Judea is a false argument. You can never find a single historian anywhere in the world that would say the Arabs owned that land for more than a hundred years. It was the Abbasid, the Umayyad, and that was it. After that came the Ottomans, you had the Crusaders even before, you had the Fatimid before, you had Egyptians, you had all kinds of people who basically began to invade that land. And not all of them are Arabs. So this is a false argument. The Palestinian National Council never asked for, to create a Palestinian state. Only until the 70s, they wanted to unite the West Bank with the East Bank, Jordan uh, with East and West Bank. So this whole is a historical fabrication and a false argument. Very, very well said, brother. Which brings me to the all-important part of this program, and it's why we're in your home. We want you to be prepared for what I believe an event that could be very, very soon, the coming of the Lord. Jesus said, if I go away, I will come again. And I always ask this, are you ready? Have you opened your heart to the Lord, been forgiven of all of your sins, anything you don't want there? You can be. Call on him today, and he'll be your Savior. Will you do that? Our brother is going to lead us in prayer right now of accepting Jesus as a personal Savior. Invite Jesus in your heart. He will come into your life and fill it with joy. You can pray after me. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Come into my life. Redeem me from my sins. I believe in your shed blood. I believe in your son. Redeem us. Redeem this world. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Did you pray that prayer with our brother? Did you ask Jesus to be your Savior, come into your life? Or if you did, you'd just become his child. You are now going to be walking with your Father. How good it is to know the Lord. First steps in a new direction will be in the mail. As soon as I hear from you, there's my address. So please let me know if you prayed that beautiful prayer of accepting Jesus as your personal Savior. Good to know you're forgiven, isn't it? Now, our wonderful offer of the week, the Judeo-Christian New World Order and my gift with your offer. And here's our announcer to tell you how you can receive it. Chuck? Thank you, Rexella, my friend, to order coming soon, the Judeo-Christian New World Order. Have your credit card ready and call toll-free, 24 hours a day, 1-800-JVI-7777. To order by mail in the U.S., send your donation of $24.95 to Jack Vanapie Ministries, Box 7004, Troy, Michigan, 48007. In Canada, send your donation of $24.95 to Jack Vanapie Ministries of Canada, Box 1717, Postal Station A, Windsor, Ontario, NINA6Y1. And now back to Rex Ellis. Thank you so very much, Chuck, and don't put it off. There's the 800 number, there's the address. Woo, you need to have this about the New World Order. It's very important. My gift with your order, so please call right away. I want to leave you with this wonderful thought. Woo, to be a healthy Christian, don't treat the Bible as snack food. Oh, my, no, fill up with the Lord's word. We we'll look forward to being in your home again next week, and until then, remember, God cares for you, so do we, so very much. Bye-bye.